Okay. Okay, um, well, uh, first of all, thank you, Camila, and it's a great honor to uh, be invited to do the opening keynote. It's a bit of a, what we call a, a bait and switch in that you can see the title is sort of altered. Um, as I got to thinking about what to do today, I, I really started collecting together different threads of um, my own work and that of other people these days on the general question of spatial inequalities. And I'm going to give some uh, different perspectives on uh, spatial inequalities um, with historical and comparative. By comparative, I mean blending my own uh, split identity as uh, an American and a European. So I'll be drawing on research that compares the two continents and tries to use that to um, to be blunt, to ask some provocative and sometimes difficult questions about what we're, uh, what's happening here in, in Europe. So uh, now, all right, first issue is, how do I change slides? So does that work? We'll work on it. So um, while we're waiting, yeah. So this is going to be uh, several different sort of reflections on spatial inequalities in relationship to um, a set of sort of like theoretical, methodological, but also practical questions for um, for Europe. Okay, great. Let's see if it works. Thank you. Good. Okay. So. Um, you know, this, these are my favorite quotes. They're, they're actually already now uh, six years old. They're from 2016 when I think we all entered into, you know, what I would call a long-term shock about the importance of regional inequalities. And they come from, you know, pretty mainstream publication. And I think those quotes are both um, reasonably uh, correct. Uh, we know that inequality, both spatial and interpersonal, is really at the center of political, social, and economic dynamics today, but that we don't have uh, good answers to uh, what to do about them. And we know what's happening politically, that these are actionable items, as they said. What I wanna do, um, therefore, is argue that uh, spatial inequalities are, are should be a core concern of a whole bunch of disciplines. And I wanna do five things. One is, want to think about why we should care about spatial inequalities. That is, what, what's the, why should this really be a core in our work? Um, I want to think about how we define them, and I'm going to place the emphasis on that, that spatial inequalities cannot be separated uh, easily from interpersonal inequalities or income distribution issues. I want to think about um, a current issue of how we measure and understand spatial inequalities, and notably, I'm going to use the US example to ask whether we're in convergence or divergence and try to come up with kind of a, a newfangled answer to that. Um, I wanna talk about the importance of historical perspective because I think that research in economics and regional science is too presentist. It doesn't use enough of historical um, a perspective to understand what's going on today. And finally, I want to look at the problem of innovation in Europe and in relationship to the question of spatial inequalities. Okay, why should we care about spatial inequalities? First set of things is from contemporary social science that looks at people in places. And there's a whole bunch of really important discoveries that have been made using new data and new measurement techniques, oftentimes outside of regional science by people in economics and sociology. And what they found are things like this that I want to have on the slides, that people, especially who have early childhood, oops, what's going on there? Okay, so people who have early childhood in places that have some combination of less prosperity, more interpersonally, that are more interpersonally unequal or segregated or stratified, that these people, as they grow up, they experience worse 
lifetime achievement in terms of inequality, social mobility, and health than people from the opposite kinds of places, meaning prosperous, integrated, inclusive type places. And a certain proportion of the lucky ones from these less fortunate places, they move and they escape their condition as adults. But this is partial. Even in the most spatially mobile societies, there are a lot of people who can't or don't move. So the, the consequences last. And the adults in those places tend to become trapped and they can't use long distance mobility to better their condition as much as the fortunate younger people who get out. They, these people then tend, at least partially, to reproduce future generations in those places with lower income, lower educational achievement, lower social mobility, lower health outcomes, and lower spatial mobility outcomes. So there's something about being, being in certain kinds of places that we now know is problematic. A second a bucket of issues or, or reasons why we should care about spatial inequality come from development theory, meaning economics and related disciplines. And so, you know, standard findings that I think all of you know are that there are trade-offs between spatial efficiency and spatial equity. That cities and density have really big efficiencies that raise incomes, but the historical process of urbanization that is still underway in lots of the developing world, but they're still underway as a change process, even in the highly urbanized parts of the world, that they tend to exacerbate inter-regional income inequalities. So there's just this straightforward problem at the heart of our field. Um, now, we have in certain countries, and especially in Europe, uh, programs for spatial redistribution, uh, depending on the country, of uh, things like income or services or public goods. And these spatial redistribution uh, programs or policies, they can, if they're well designed and well administered, they can reduce some of the gaps in the standard of living uh, between places. But the ability of spatial, direct spatial redistribution to raise more, to, to have dy dynamic positive consequences, meaning to raise spatial and intergenerational social mobility of persons while it is positive, it's stubbornly limited. It turns out to not be all that good. In narrow sort of cost terms, spatial distribution has a kind of a contradiction, which is if you spatially redistribute things like income or public services or public goods, right? You may run up against a contradictory distributional effect between persons like social, social classes or ethnic groups that are unevenly distributed across places. A standard example would be say from France, we put a post office in every little rural village, but the cost of doing that is magnitudes of order higher than what we would get if we were to put a post office in a crowded ethnic suburb of Paris, right? So in, in pure budgetary terms, the intergroup or interpersonal distributional effects are not the same, don't necessarily line up with the spatial redistributional effects. The total cost of spatial redistribution, um, it really fascinates me that we don't know it. Um, if I've, in the countries that I've looked at, we have usually hundreds or thousands of different budgetary items that try to achieve spatial redistribution, but we can't estimate the total social uh, cost across all of these programs. There may be, um, costs, uh, for example, in, in, in total uh, social welfare outcomes in that if you redistribute, you reduce the efficiency outcomes of big cities. But some of these costs might be offset if the redistribution raises the output and reduce costly social pathologies in the places that you're redistributing to, right? In the less prosperous places. What's really interesting is that I don't know of really any papers that try to do this, which is, I don't think the fault of anyone, except that it's an extremely difficult task to do, but it kind of fascinates me that we don't have programs like governmental agencies that actually want to do it. And I think the reason is that they don't want to do it. So we don't get the data or the money to do it. Okay, so those are really interesting things about, we know that spatial inequalities are really important. And the last one, of course, is that spatial inequality we now know harms political stability, harms trust within society, and reduces cooperation, 
and it's a really difficult to measure dynamic cost, but we're living through it right now. Okay, now um, there are responses that we sort of developed collectively to these, uh, these uh, dilemmas. A traditional you know, mainstream response is of course to just emphasize economic growth, right? And to assume that by enlarging the pie that there will be some kind of miraculous trickle down process to people and places and that it'll create this rising tide that lifts all boats. But we know that this is not basically not true um, because it loops back to the, uh, the tendency of the economy to concentrate a lot of the good stuff through agglomeration effects and through interpersonal inequalities. So this is really not anymore an adequate response. Um, if it ever could be taken seriously, I don't think it can be now. More recently, in geography and economics, many of us, I think collectively, are working on tr try and identify theories and practices that would maximize uh, inclusive development. That is inclusive in both interpersonal and um, geographical or spatial terms. So the idea, I think, is to raise potential output um, and dynamic opportunity everywhere, right? Without the downsides that I've just reviewed meaning a sort of equity that is not a zero sum game either between people within the income distribution or between places uh, uh, across different kinds of regions uh, and cities. And a lot of us are exploring the value, the potential value of place-based policies that could somehow try to achieve these non-zero sum results, right? That reconcile the imperatives of economic growth with the two kinds of equity. Okay, so that's a really uh, big task. And I think collectively, a lot of people in this room, I suspect that we're all um, engaged in it. But I wanna argue now in the rest of my presentation that the goal still eludes us, uh, which, isn't, um, uh, which is all the more reason to try and pursue it. But I'm gonna try and show some difficulties with it. Okay, so first uh, point I wanna make then is starting to get into this more scientifically speaking is what do we mean by spatial inequalities? And I draw inspiration here from, I think I actually, it's from Branko Milanovic and Francois Bourguignon, both of who you know, worked together at the World Bank and, and put together, I think, some you know, really interesting perspectives on what they call the fractal nature of inequalities in the world. And they come up with, um, with five dimensions, like a five dimensional measurement problem that we all need to consider when we're trying to think about what we mean by these inequalities. So first of all, we know from international comparisons that there's inequality in the mean income of some spatial unit, like say a region or a country, unweighted by population. Uh, the problem you know, there is of course that when you put in a bunch of non-standard units, right, that don't have any kind of weight on them, uh, you can come up with a picture of inequalities that tends to overweight the lightly populated, right? Especially if you have a bunch of lightly populated, really poor or really rich places. That's what happens in the international data, but it could also happen in non-standard regional data within um, a country. And so if you ask whether there's convergence or divergence going on, you have a distortion. A second, of course, thing, you know, is what, you know, Xavier Sala y Martin in the 90s told us was, well, then you weight them. And, uh, you know, you may, have all, may all recall that famous paper where he showed that, the unweighted data show that the world's diverging and weighted data show that it's converging. And the reason it's converging is because a bunch of big countries like China and India were having rapid income growth. And that would be the same thing within countries, right? For any, any spatial units that you use. So of course that would underweight the lightly populated. And I think what, what both Bourguignon and Milanovic say to us is both of them, neither of them is wrong and neither of them is totally right. What they do is they shed different lights uh, on the question, because places are real. It doesn't matter whether there's a non-standard area or not. Uh, this is reality on the ground and you wanna look at it from different angles. And so another thing you can do is the third thing on this slide, which is um, you can consider, for example, within any of these spatial units, how evenly is the uh, income distributed, right? So if you wanna compare, let's say, I don't know, you know, like a Scandinavian country with a really low Gini coefficient to a similarly sized place with a really high Gini coefficient, right? We know, of course, that 
um, comparing them in terms of average income will tend to efface the fact that the income is distributed to a lot of people relatively equal in one place, but not in another. So um, we have to consider that. That's a third like fractal dimension of the problem when comparing places is what are their internal interpersonal income distributions. And there's a way you can do that, of course, a little game you can play statistically is you can artificially pool them, right? So create artificial borderless worlds like the whole world. What does the Gini coefficient on world population look like compared to the Gini coefficients within places and the convergence or divergence across places? And that gives you another kind of insight into what's going on. Or you could do it for things like the European Union. You can do it for the United States by pooling the states. And so this, um, this, of course, is an interesting insight, but they can tend to erase the spatial differentiation. So again, it's not, it's not an either or, it's like another added layer of knowledge. And I think the, fi the, the, the final point is you can do endless, um, endless decomposition or what you might call the Russian dolls approach, right? Of units within units within units. And the more granularity you get, the more insights you're going to get into finer types of spatial inequality. Okay, so um, I actually, you know, here's what I try to do with it when I think about my own work today, which is that a definition of spatial inequality should integrate both people and place distributions, right? It should, it should sort of have something like inequalities and in real per capita income between places, that's between, it should have inequalities in dynamics of opportunity for persons within different places, some way to measure how well what's going on in places is making people over time dynamically better off. And third, some kind of interaction term for what's within place inequality and uh, between place inequality in incomes or opportunities. That's already a lot, but I think it's a reasonably good like workhorse sort of theory definition of what, uh, what we might want to think about as people who are interested in economic development. And you can see like illustrations of that, right? If you take uh, something like, um, like this, where you, you take um, incomes across the world, you can see that the growth of incomes in the world between 1980 and 2016 was, there was a lot of growth at the bottom of the world um, income distribution. This is pooling the global population. You can see a lot of growth at the very top, the top 1% on the right. And in the middle, you can see that sinking U uh, shaped of some kind of pressure on, uh, on incomes. And what, what's interesting about them, of course, is taking that global population and adding the little comments in this graphic on the space of it, right? you know that you know much more about what's going on, which is that a bunch of developing countries are uh, on the left-hand side, a bunch of highly de form of, of already developed high-income countries are in the middle, and, at the, and on the right-hand side are rich people everywhere across the world, okay? So space and people always have to be interacted in sort of thinking about in a deep way, you have to think about how they integrate. Um, here's kind of a fun counterfact. Joel, and I think this was done by um, Gabriel Zuckman at Berkeley. Uh, so um, if you think about more average income spatial equality, it might actually worsen global interpersonal inequality. You can see in the, in the counterfactuals, look at what happens in, so you have the global 10% share on the top line. In the red line, what you have is the global top 10%, which would, what would happen to it if you equalize mean incomes across countries, is it actually the global top 10% would rise, right? And you would get more bang, as it were, for your buck, more effect in lowering global um, inequality if you equalized income distributions within places rather than trying to equalize average income across places, given the current world income distribution. So again, I'm not trying to convince you that there's sort of like one answer to this but to sort of get us to think about this fractal interactional nature of spatial and personal um, inequalities. And I think that's what Milanovic and Bourguignon always encourage us to do is look at all of the levels and try to think about what your data mean. Okay, now 
I want to move on and use an example of the debate about US spatial inequality, about whether there's convergence or divergence going on. And the reason to a European audience that this might be interesting is, as it usually is, the US is a really good big data set, right, with a lot of integration. So it's kind of like this workhorse, you know, test case that we can use for, for theory testing. And I think all of you know that the, you know, the classical convergence model from the 1960s of Bortz and Stein, uh, who still dominates the field, at least in the economic modeling. And it's been updated, of course, with fancier, more, more eloquent spatial equilibrium models in recent years. And those have a strong version where they predict that across regions with strong integration and a lot of mobility, that you'll get real income or utility convergence across places, or the weaker version of wage convergence adjusted for skills, or some kind of total utility convergence across households, uh, but, uh, but modified by basically what their income level is, okay? But as, of course, the great formulator of modern spatial equilibrium theory, Ed Glazer, said recently, convergence theory reached its peak just as convergence ended using that, the US case. And the reason that I think he made that statement is that empirical research on spatial inequalities in America shifted spatial scale from the states of the US, so think about Europe and European member states as an equivalent scale, to counties or commuting zones, which are, you know, which are strong, a granular decompositions of the space. And once research did this, from 2015 onward, we discovered, and now I think there's consensus, that divergence or spatial inequality have risen steadily since 1980. Okay, after a century where there was either interstate convergence or something I'll show you, maybe there wasn't. So many other researchers have confirmed this turn to spatial inequality starting in 1980, okay? And the, the complement to it is something that's very important uh, in terms of explanation and theory, which is aggregate long-term migration has also declined steadily for all income groups in America compared to the entire preceding century from 1880 to 1980 and current migration to the extent that people do move, which in theory, as you know, is an equalizing force in the classical convergence theories, that this current migration is not equalizing because it's very strongly income selective. Highly skilled people move up the urban hierarchy, other people move down or don't move at all. So using this kind of data, we can also now go further back in time and what we discover is that prior to 1980, there was a convergence period in the United States case, okay? And it was followed by this post-1980 reversal. So Moretti uh, early on named it the great divergence uh, in his book in wages. And since we now know it's not only wages, it's uh, that is average wages, for example, even, uh, even controlling for education, are much more dispersed over space uh, than they used to be, uh, but it's also total incomes and a whole set of other attributes like social mobility, health, and lifetime achievement. Okay, these are data that Tom Kemeny and I have been doing for our own project. We use commuting zones, so that's a really fine granular uh, decomposition of space, and you can see household. Um, you can see household wage income on the left, where it clicks up a little bit, but then really turns up in the 21st century, or you can see wages on the right where the, the, the 1980 uh, uh, breaking point is really clear. And what this slide shows is, what, what I want you to do here really quickly is notice the difference between the green line and the other two lines. The green line is less educated people. So their wages are not diverging across space. If you're a low, wage, low skilled person, almost anywhere you work in the United States, your wages are gonna be pretty similar. But if you're highly skilled, uh, that, that is your wages are gonna be similar and um, um, yeah, they're gonna be similar across space. If you're a highly skilled worker 
and the more highly skilled, the more the effect kicks in, uh, the more your wages will diverge across places. Okay, so what this tells us is that the current period of divergence is being driven largely by the wages and the spatial location of the highly educated and highly remunerated. That's just a kind of a map for the people who don't know America here. The darker the colors, the higher the, um, the uh, median household income, and it's pretty much a metropolitan geography versus a less metropolitan geography. Pretty straightforward, like what you would get for a lot of countries. Now, okay, so there you might say is now what is the new standard picture of spatial inequality uh, that I think many of us know and that you could find in a bunch of European countries as well. And you could also find in China and a few other countries outside of the developed West. But maybe that's not the only story, right? Maybe the story is actually more complex when you use some other techniques to measure it. So again, with um, Tom Kemeny, my research collaborator, we've been doing what we call group-based trajectory modeling which is a technique that people in sociology and criminology use to think about how groups within the population evolve over time. And um, it's a kind of um, unsupervised machine learning technique. This is like the part of the, you know, the talk where everybody these days, we wanna show off like our fancy data and techniques because we live in this tech world where that's part of our, right? But anyway, I'm making fun of myself, I hope you see. Um, so we, we did use this fancy technique and what it does is it takes all these commuting zones and it sees in some kind of machine learning way how, how their trajectories might be similar or different over time. And what, we, what, it, what the machine gave us was between one trajectory and 15. And then we did a few other tricks that I don't have time to describe to you uh, and came up with this as a model of six groups of places in America. These are all groups of commuting zones, okay? And the legend at the bottom tells you the percentage of commuting zones that are in each trajectory. And I want you to look at the top line, which is 3.5% of commuting zones that have roughly 40% of the US population in them and 60% of US economic output. And they're the superstar metropolitan areas. There are about 15 metropolitan areas. And this, okay, the other thing is the first year there is 1940. So the two is 1950, 1960, 19, the four is 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010, 2019, okay? So notice right in the middle, 1980, where the distribution of all these place trajectories is the most compressed, right? That's the point of greatest convergence between 1940 and 1980. And it's convergence in dynamic terms. And then they spread apart again. But the main force spreading them apart is the superstar cities, which have always been on top. And they sort of like tendentially come a little close to the rest, but then they explode back as income differentiated again. The purple line, the light purple line there, is mostly the former heavy industrial cities that have sunk down the income hierarchy uh, toward the middle. The dark blue line at the bottom are usually places in the American South that were rural and poor and, and poorly integrated spatially. And they were brought into, you might say, post-war American capitalism. And they became a little richer because factories went to them to take advantage of cheap rural labor. And you get a couple of other interesting cases in there. But here's, I think, the most um, sort of, let's take that as a, as a sort of an overall picture. And maybe it's not just a story of divergence or the divergence story is too simple, right? So um, superstars have always been on top. I think that's a strong story. But most of the other places you'll notice are converging toward the middle, right? If you look at the first year and the last year, the distribution is much widely, is, is much bigger in, the, in 1940 than it is in 2019. So spatial integration and capital mobility and a whole bunch of other forces have drawn the American space economy together, except for the superstar cities. 
And Tom and I are thinking that actually maybe it's a story of both convergence and divergence, right? That may be just talking about inequality, though it is obviously a super important story, especially because the superstars are 40% of the population, 60% of the population. Nonetheless, something else is going on in the vast array of other places across the continent. So what does it mean for development, right? Well, we don't know actually. First of all, we don't know. And this is the part of the talk where I say collectively, these are, these are kind of like fun, interesting topics that all of us should now find answers to. Like, we don't know um, whether, um, whether, for example, in the long run, what's going to dominate is the superstar pull away, whether it's the catch up of other places due to structural integration, um, or some, or whether there will be some kind of migration away from superstars that are very expensive. And journalists love that topic, like everybody's leaving New York, right? And you see it everywhere except in the income numbers, but whatever. Um, here's the most important point. We don't know actually what will happen in the future to the other five groups. For example, look at that red line. The red line is a bunch of places that were sort of right close to the, right close to the average in 1940. And they've kind of been moving up over time and there are a few places in that group, uh, and I forgot to put, I have some really cool maps that I forgot to put in the slide set, sorry. Um, but we don't know what, whether they, in the long run, will become new superstars or not. In other words, actually we don't know whether it's a, it's, it's a long-term conversion story. What we see is a lot of different dynamics, right? We don't know, for example, I think it's a decent guess that the superstars are on top and will stay on top for a long time, but I can't tell you about what will happen to the other groups. And in particular, right, we don't know whether some of the other groups are what Simona and I and our team would call development trapped. That some of these groups may have come up, but they may have hit a ceiling, okay? And we see a lot of evidence of that in European regions. Okay, longer term perspective. Um, current divergence, as I said, was preceded by convergence and a previous divergence. So that's the new story. These are Piketty type data on 1% income shares in the Anglophone countries. And what you see is that the middle of the 20th century looks pretty atypical compared to the, to the period before it and the period after it. This is Europe, the non-Anglophone uh, part, mostly uh, Western Europe. And you see that there was a very high high income inequality period in the early 20th century, followed by the same lowering, and then an uptick which is much more moderate, but is still there. So Europe and America or Europe and the Anglophone world are similar in the overall trends, different in the overall magnitudes. And I'll come back to this. Uh, the point that I wanna make here is that divergence and convergence have histories and probably structural causes. And uh, why am I saying this? Because if you were to read a lot of the spatial inequality literature today, particularly with the, theor the theory-based papers on economics, you get the impression that there is no history, right? You get the impression that somewhere in 1980, firms woke up and said, we really want to agglomerate and not spread out. And wor talented workers said, I only want to live in New York and San Francisco and be with other people like me, right? Whereas if you look at the data, what you see is that if in the mid 20th century, notably between roughly the 1920, 1930 and 1980, skilled workers were spreading out, internal migration was not income directional and technology intensive firms of the day were de-agglomerating, not agglomerating. So research should bear in mind that there's a history and not make up stories that are entirely presentist because those stories are likely to miss out the big cause. And the big cause, I think, is industrial revolutions, or what you might call general purpose technological revolutions. We're in the third one, maybe in the fourth, right? There was the textile revolution and water power and textiles. There was the mechanical and electrical revolution of the late 1930, 20th century. And there's the digital and financial and globalization revolution of the 1970s onward, right? These pretty well fit the data. So Tom and I play with this kind of framework where industrial revolutions happen, they have peak inequality, 
So there's the three, the steam, the dynamo, and the ICT revolution. And we're speculating that we're kind of at the apogee or, or at least still going into a period of high inequality driven by the, the economics and the geography of the third industrial revolution. And I'm only saying, I'm not saying that's the only cause. There are probably policy causes and all kinds of other things going on. But I find that there is uh, not sufficient attention to the structural and historical uh, determinants of long-term changes in spatial and interpersonal inequality. Okay, last thing I wanna do in this talk, and I'm almost out of time, but this is actually the most provocative thing I wanna do, is I wanna talk about America and Europe, and I wanna talk about innovation geographies and inequalities, okay? So the EU and its members countries, as you know, we are full of regional development frameworks, redistribution frameworks, mostly at a national level, regional innovation agendas, structural funds, Lisbon agendas, smart specialization, and all the other stuff that we all work on, okay? Um, some of the regional distribution the, uh, agenda, as I mentioned, has worked depending on the country. Um, and um, it's worked also across countries like in successful developing countries um, here in Eastern Europe, which have had brilliant success in uh, raising their incomes. Uh, hasn't worked within countries as well as across countries, meaning that at the same time that we're integrating parts of Europe, most of Europe is suffering from uh, growing uh, regional inequalities within countries. Now, However, so that's, I think there's probably a, a, some, some kind of success story in our integration and structural funds and cohesion agenda. Not perfect by any means, but certainly not a disaster. What is a disaster, now I'm gonna be really provocative, is our innovation agenda, okay? Not only has we not managed to spatially spread innovation, but we've also failed to stimulate it across Europe in a, in a convincingly measurable uh, way. And for history, let's remember that Europe was an innovation leader, a global innovation leader in the first and second industrial revolutions. And Europe is a failure in the third industrial revolution. I'm using this term absolutely deliberately. I thought a lot about this term and whether it's worth it, whether, whether it's accurate, but it is. Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Alphabet, Cisco, Netflix, and Tesla. What is common to all of them is that they are American, right? Europe has become a second mover, copying and realizing some of the general purpose technologies that are invented and implemented or commercialized in America, but inventing and dominating none of them, right? In a continent that is high income and that has world-class basic science, something's wrong with that picture. And it's measurable, right? This is the top 100 companies in the world by market capitalization. And look at what's happened to Europe. Its big firms are legacy firms that are being marginalized on world capital markets, right? And there's plenty of capital out there looking for opportunities. It's just that the returns aren't that good in Europe anymore for the big firms. Venture capital, you all know this story. Everybody loves the latest journalistic story of some startup somewhere in Europe that is really cool and the latest thing happening. But as a Euro-American, I can tell you it's peanuts, right? It has absolutely no relationship to the rivers of capital that are amassed for funding innovation in America, as you can see. So is being a second mover a problem? I've given this talk, th these kind of remarks before, and the typical reaction that I get is, it's not a problem because we're successful, we're high income, we have better quality of life than America and less inequality, something I'll come to. But I don't think that's the right reaction. I think in the long term, economic development and power depend on mastering innovation. I think that's what economic historians tell us. And we should take historians seriously. Right? They show how power moves when technology moves, okay? We do have the quality of life and all kinds of good things like that, but we are not um, moving into the highest ranks of world development. 
Now, there's no Silicon Valley in Europe. Right? So there's a geography, there are geographical causes and outcomes of our innovation failure. And to put it in a kind of a cliche way, there is no Silicon Valley in Europe in terms of innovation size, diversity, complexity, or performance. There's not even an Austin, a Seattle, a Boston, or a San Diego. You could go down to like the third or fourth level of innovation agglomerations in America before you get something comparable to most of the top ones. There might be one or two exceptions in Europe. I'm not gonna name them here, but you know what they are. But basically we don't have them. Now, two decades ago, the EU commission worried about whether European integration would Americanize European economic geography. So my colleague, Henry Overman was one of the leading scholars on that topic. And he showed that the USA and the EU city systems were not converging in the sense that the American urban system has, it's, it has bigger urban units that tend to be more specialized than equivalent European cities, but with lower spatial inter interaction. And Europe conversely has smaller cities, right? With a lower productivity premium, more, right, more spatial interaction and a bigger role for middle-sized cities. So this is kind of like the base of our different urban histories and something that we know we have to work with. But this was received with relief in Europe. Relief because, oh great, nothing's changing. European integration can happen and everything can stay the same in terms of the shape of our wonderful urban system. Now, however, my uh, colleagues, uh, Ricardo Crescenzi and Andreas Rodriguez Bus and I did some work on comparative innovation geographies and we confirmed that picture. We confirmed that American cities using their bigger city size and greater specialization tend to have a bigger innovation premium than European cities do, related to size and related to specialization. So are these things connected? They are obviously connected. That what we're trying to do in Europe is do 21st century innovation with wonderful, beautiful urban systems inherited from centuries past, which doesn't mean that they, you know, I mean, I'm not here to propose to you to turn Europe into an America. I actually think Europe's a lot nicer than America in a lot of ways, and certainly in terms of quality of life. But the ability to create big specialized innovation centers by rearranging capital knowledge and specialized labor is clearly one of the bases for American innovation success. And very few, if any, European regions can equal this capacity. And yet, here's my problem. Research on, you know, on the geography of innovation in Europe, we're avoiding this hard reality. We are go on and on kind of measuring on the margin how you know, smart specialization or various other kinds of spatial interaction or whatnot can somehow create a world-class innovation performance and geography that, that is more spatially distributed and equitable than its American counterpart. But there isn't any evidence for this. There isn't any serious evidence because Europe's innovation performance is so far below that of America that you can't actually link those two things together. So geography isn't the only reason for the innovation gap, right? There are institutional and policy reasons, and I'm gonna to come to those in concluding because some of them aren't so good. They're, they're a negative reflection on America. But the point is that, that I'm kind of urging in this talk today is we must absolutely take on the question of why Europe isn't more of an innovation leader and what spatial factors and geographies might have to do with it. Because without that, we're just gonna continue perpetuating, I think the illusion that everything can be fine here uh, in Europe in doing what we're doing. And I don't think our policies are the right ones. So here's the last thought in this talk. Innovativeness brings inequalities. It brings really sharp inequalities. The drama that we are living through in America, of course, is one of extreme rises in inequalities that you saw in the data. Now, there's a debate over where these inequalities come from. To simplify, you might say one group says it's all because America's neoliberal, and be, whereas in, in Europe, we have a more kind of regulated capitalism that, that stamps the inequalities down. I think there's clearly relevance uh, to that kind of claim that certain kinds of policies carried out in some of the European countries 
do tend, they tend to push up the lower end of the income distribution and they sort of hold the line on the upper tail inequality. Although upper tail inequality before redistribution is really high in a lot of Western Europe. But Gini coefficients before redistribution for Paris and London are identical, 0.53, really high, okay? So policy has something to do with it, all right? But not everything. A lot I think of the differences are that the market pressures for inequality in America are much higher than Europe because America is so successful at innovation. And you can see this now in the emerging research on the link between top wages, top incomes and innovation and their geography. All these things are linked. In my own research, we're showing very clearly that where you have new work that's closely related to new technologies, you get new occupations with very high wages. These wages are converted into wealth and they, and, and they augment both interpersonal and spatial inequality. So you can see the differences right between the continents. You can see that's America. That's what's happened in Europe. So the question I think I want to ask in closing here is, right, um, would it be possible to carve out a pathway for Europe that is mo more innovative in, in a serious way, right, but without American style spatial and social inequalities? Is there an alternative pathway to prosperity without being a cutting edge, or, and, and or conversely, uh, can we be a, a prosperous continent without being a cutting edge, disruptively innovative continent? I think the answer is no, but I'm very, I would be very happy to be disproved on that point. But the point is we don't have adequate answers to these questions because in Europe, we haven't asked the questions enough in our research. When you survey papers in our field, in economics, in sociology, in political science, in, in, in innovation policy, what you don't see is an active debate in Europe about these issues, all right? You see mostly a kind of a silence, a kind of what I would call, you know, bien pensant silence, a politically correct silence. Okay, so I think we need to reframe. Um, and I think the question for Europe or the one I dream of is the Goldilocks development pathway, right? So, you know, astrophysics, they have that thing about the Goldilocks zone, which is the inhabitable zone between the extremes of the universe. And I actually think that's, a, for me, I use it as a metaphor when I try to think about what do we need to think about in Europe? And that is, what are the possible pathways that our continent could follow? On the one hand, to respect our city systems, our cultures, our landscapes, our, our peoples, our way of life, and yet also somehow uh, become much more innovative and reconcile that with the kinds of lifestyles and inequalities that we find uh, acceptable, which are different here from what they are in the United States, right? And so we have to really think about that, right? But I, again, I wanna editorialize and be it's self-criticism as much as anything else. I think a lot of what, what I see is avoiding the question. So I've tried to make these broad points today. I'm gonna to end there and uh, thanks for listening. And I hope at least I've provoked some debate. Thank you a lot, a very, very inspiring speech. And I think uh, many questions will come. So uh, I open the floor for questions from people in the room. Uh, there are a couple of microphones around. So if you can raise your hand, uh, we can uh, see you. There is a question there. We can collect uh, a few questions, three, four, and then uh, leave Michael the reply. Thank you. Uh, I, I think this combination of geography, innovation, and inequality is, is a very inspiring one. I would like to emphasize what you put on your slides, but have not really mentioned, the big difference between the US and EU. You said, so it, it was already pointed out by Henry Argas in the 80s that mobility is, is much more intense, much faster in the US 
therefore uh, knowledge is diffusing much faster much more effectively people are moving between uh, geographically and also between different types of sectors different types of jobs so what for instance knowledge created in universities then it can be applied either by government agencies or by firms or the other way around because people are moving across sectors as well not only geographically and you, you mentioned another point that uh, there are important barriers in inside the eu in terms of language culture structures social care whatever so from a different angle i think it would be important to take into account the macro level structures as well not only the structures of uh, cities, urban uh, economies. From uh, another different angle, I think the problem is that uh, we, we try to slice innovation systems as national ones, regional ones, technological ones, and we, we don't take into account that actually actors are sitting in all these slices. So it, it's for some reasons it's understandable that we slice but if we want to understand the actual phenomenon, the actual development, then we have to take into account all these levels, different levels. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Yes, there is another one there. Can you please go up? Yeah, there, so. there is a next Sure. Yeah, so I have a microphone already. So okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Artem Korzenevich from uh, Dresden, Germany. Um, so my question will be about, let's say, I, I have a background of an interdisciplinary um, research institute uh, focusing on sustainability issues in urban regional context. So um, in this in this field, there is kind of a narrative that okay, um, US is much more advanced in technological and innovation, so ICT innovation, but in Europe you have much more progress in social innovation, environmental innovation, and if you kind of define an objective of the society not related to growth, but related to sustainability and uh, let's say equal opportunities and, and uh, healthy environment, then Europe has a better potential, yeah, more potential, more dynamic. So uh, the question is, so what, what is your take on this? So if uh, you know, if if you think that this uh, social innovation, environmental innovation kind of dimensions can also be put on a graph like this, and maybe there is another than a different story to that. Great. Okay. Yes, please. And then there was uh, the lady there with the yellow. Thank you. My question, just actually follow up the, the previous one, uh, because I was wondering, what are your uh, um, fundamental assumption for your arguments. And um, because from what I was listening, I, I, my feeling is that it's very capitalistic view of the arguments. And uh, uh, the idea that innovation is mainly connected to technology uh, innovation, rather than as was uh, raised before, in Europe, we are also focusing with the, the Green Deal, with the Industry 5.0, with the digital agenda on a more sustainable view of development. And the other question, so the first one is, uh, what are the assumptions for the arguments? And the second one, uh, do you think that the measures that we are using to assess inequality, to assess innovation are complete? Because probably we are missing some uh, dimension that will tell a different story and then uh, uh, we will see a different way of looking at to the uh, to the development. Thank you. Okay. Yes, please. Last question, and then. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Diana Gutierrez from the University of Oviedo in Spain. Thank you very much for a very thought provocative uh, opening lecture. Uh, and my question is somehow aligned with the not the last one, but the previous one about that sort of last controversial statement that you put in there, so we shouldn't let our innovation agendas being uh, guided or too much influenced by politically correct um, ideas. And I wanted to ask you to please elaborate on that. What do you consider 
are those politically correct? Because, you know, getting into muddy waters, I would say that if you mean uh, populism, uh, opportunism, I completely agree with you. But if you mean other things more related to uh, equality, as you sort of present this trade off between both things that seem to emerge in the empirical research, or if you mean other kind of things, just I just wanted to your more detailed take on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We already have uh, other two questions, but uh, we give first uh, the yeah. possibility for replies, and then we go with uh, a second round of questions. So um, I'll, I'll, it's not my habit, as people know, I, I tend to talk a lot, but I'm gonna try to give really brief, res brief responses, um, which don't do justice to your questions in the interest of going on. Okay, and then you know we can discuss more. Um, so the mobility question, yes, historically, uh, the US had higher uh, levels of internal mobility uh, than Europe. That's no longer the case. So internal mobility that is long distance moving in America basically collapsed in 1980 and never came back to its historical pre-1980 levels. And like I said, it's hierarchical, meaning it's directional according to income. That's a huge change. So the American kind of mechanism of equalizing incomes and opportunities, though imperfect in the past, right, isn't there anymore. So in now, Europe's of course more complicated because of borders, language, culture, uh, a more recent integration experiment and so on. I think, so what we're, we know that mobility isn't like in the canonical models, first of all, we know it's not frictionless. We know that his, historical changes are happening both in Europe and in America. I think that leads to the, the, the real quandary that we have for policy, which is that to create world-class innovation, if that's what you want to do, and I know that those are the other questions, but to create world-class innovation, you must have the ability to either create a lot of world-class innovators in a lot of places, and or to move them around and combine them so they interact and spread the innovation, sorry. So I don't have a perfect answer for that by any means for, for Europe. What I think is, though, that we're not, again, framing the question clearly, which is, what do we want, right? If we want to have everyone stay kind of in their home region and in their own culture and contribute to it, which I think is a really, personally, it's a great goal. I would love for every region to be equally dynamic in a highly equal, integrated, uh, non-hierarchical world. I'm not sure I know how to do that. And all, I th all I'm saying is that we need to have um, an, an answer to it, right? In a, I'll give you the, the example of France. France is very similar to America, right? The talented people, they move to Paris, right? And that's why Paris is super highly performing in productivity terms because all of the talent drains there. And then later on, they might go home, right? Which is kind of a life cycle thing. And they bring some of their talent and money with them. That's also what people do in America when they move to Florida or Arizona or Texas, right? Where, where it's warmer. But the point is, we need to have a clear frame on this and we don't. Okay, so the, the, the next two questions were about, you know, what do we mean? What do you mean about, is it ICT or is it social environmental you know, sustainability? Um, types of innovations. And then another question was, am I sort of being capitalistic? So, you know, um, I was trained in graduate school as a Marxist. Um, and one thing when you're trained as a Marxist, which I don't identify with now, personally, but one thing that Marx was really good on was he said, you really need to understand capitalism as a system, right? That it has rules, that are built in that you might not like, but you really need to understand. And I think that's the case that we face here in Europe. I am absolutely not uh, here advocating uh, a world in which innovation is dominated by Apple or Google or Tesla. Um, and I very much admire and feel that it is essential and important to have all these other forms of innovation. 
But returning to the subject of economics, right? In capitalism, the system that we live under, right? The power and the money flow to certain kinds of innovations, which have productivity and market creation payoffs, right? That's why the money and the power flow to them. There is no way to isolate ourselves from that in Europe, right? The power and the money flow to China and to America will happen whether we like it or not. And in order for us to hold our own and be able to shape markets in the world, notably to be able to shape consumer markets on one side and capital and investment markets on the other side, we have to own the big technologies in equality with the Americans and the Chinese and whoever else comes along in the 21st century to be an innovation powerhouse because otherwise they will own us, right? So this isn't an ideological uh, point. It's about understanding the system that we live in and the imperative of us playing in this system so that we can turn it toward our own ends of social, environmental, and other forms of justice, right? But if you don't have the money, you don't get to play the game, right? So that's um, kind of a strong editorial point. And I think that goes to the last question about you know, political correctness. All I meant to say there is that um, there's a tendency it, it, for us in innovation policy and research circles in Europe to not deal with the obvious uh, failure of Europe to create world dominating companies in the third industrial revolution. That's the political correctness part, right? It's embarrassing actually. I think uh, I find it embarrassing for our continent. And I think as researchers, we are, we're not owned by the policymakers. And that's the point about our intellectual independence is that it's up to us to force these kinds of uh, issues onto the agenda and ask for there to be debates about it by virtue of the research results that we produce. Okay, we have a second round. There was a question here and then there in the first. How many? <laughs> okay, please, Evan. Yeah. Michael, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, is it working? Perhaps you have to switch it on. Yeah, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very inspiring uh, keynote. And it also had so many dimensions to, uh, to respond to. And I do strongly uh, also uh, align with the, the focus on social innovation and technical innovation. And there is a difference. And I think also difference in terms of leadership of our continents. Uh, and, and we should, um, I also understand your answer that we should be, we are in a kind of system, but perhaps we can still be powerful enough to somehow change that system into a place um, where more livable, let's say. But my question that I wanted to have was, you, you started also very nice about the interpersonal and interspatial inequalities and how there's a difference between the superstars and let's say the cities or the regions below that. And I wonder, I, I like also your idea of having innovation inequality geography agenda. And would you say then that you would want to have different agendas for super stars and the regions below that to match both their potential but also their needs because I would, what you were saying about cities there are so there are so much inequality in cities so I, I was afraid you would almost say we need more money for cities to solve these inequalities and at the same time we need more money for cities to have the innovations and then the cities end up with all the money and I think also that's not what we want so could we should we differentiate in there and, and then how should we do that No, there, there. <laughs> Next one. Technology. <laughs> um, Matthias Stein of Vrije Universiteit and the uh, Utrecht University. Um, I think you, you said at some point, oh, yeah, I, this, this is not ideological, but there's, yeah. I think quite some um, ideology uh, involved. On one hand, you, we don't want to play fully the game and have the big companies. At the other hand, uh, uh, we have the money. 
I need the money, but um, earlier there was a question on the assumptions. And one of the things that struck me is that the difference you showed in how effective the USA was, was mostly, for example, in, in market capitalization. And that a lot of that shows um, a value for shareholders. And we've seen recently a few works and I've found your work very inspiring. I've seen quite a lot of your presentations that yeah, you in included a work of Milanovic. But one offer I was missing was maybe Mariana Mazzucato with what is the value of everything. And uh, maybe one way of trying to move towards um, uh, uh, more sustainable, but having more innovation is really questioning what is value and how to measure value and different kinds of uh, welfare measures. So I was wondering what your take is on this. Uh, I think the previous ask of question would be interested in knowing on broad welfare measures, et cetera, and how to, we could combine these to kind of end play the game, but also move towards a more sustainable and just society. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Stefano Ragona from uh, I'm Town Planner, University of Reggio Calabria. Um, thank you for a very interesting uh, your keynote lecture. Uh, but uh, I am wondering that, oh, my question is uh, very uh, in line, online with the previous uh, questions. Uh, the word ecological transition uh, doesn't appear in your presentation. I am uh, very interesting to know what you think about that. Uh, another thing, I, I, I will be very short, huh? uh, connected to the uh, uh, state situation, uh, if you think uh, uh, San, um, Silicon Valley and San Francisco, there are huge process of gentrification, very connected to the innovation. Huh? And uh, they are also connected to the sustainable mobility. Huh? Uh, another thing, uh, I think and many of us as town planners, we think that we are too much Americanized uh, because we have uh, taken in these 20, 30 years, uh, the American style of planning, that is, uh, there is not planning at all. I'm very short, of course. Um, another thing, uh, and the last one, is a, the different concept of development. I think that we should uh, much more connected to the Agenda 2030 United Nation and uh, to the New Green Deal. Um, so I think that uh, we, and as uh, many questions before I said, uh, we have uh, to think uh, in a, a larger, wider thing uh, and uh, to consider much more integrated point of view and not only um, I think uh, the, the before income point of view uh, driving. Huh? Thanks you very much. Okay, there is this question and the very last one. <laughs> Just a short question. Uh, you mostly talked about uh, the US EU comparison, but uh, China has became recently part uh, of the techno global system is it something to learn or fear of the chinese ecosystem and uh, techno global system if it's so i guess uh this is working. the very last question and a very short one thank you very much for convincing and inspiring uh, presentation uh, in your uh, slides you've been mentioning smart specialization several times in my understanding that was the european answer to ever increasing innovation gap uh, with the world. Uh, now studies show that in some places it did increase innovative performance, in some not, in some uh, there was more uh, of specialization, in some not, but probably these processes take time. What is your opinion on that? Thank you very much. All right, so, um, so very, these are very, very big questions. It's really hard like to respond. So, um, I think for, for the first question on sort of the, again, extending the discussion about other kinds of innovation, social, environmental, um, lifestyle innovations, and so on, that aren't just the American style, you know, Apple, Facebook, all that stuff. Um, so um, 
there, I think, look, we absolutely need to have a debate about that. Um, there is, I'll return to it, but I think the real issue with that is whether one can do that alone and still be powerful in the world capitalist system. So let me come back to that. I wanna be very provocative, right? Does it require, in other words, essentially just doing some other kind of economic system? So bracket that for a second. Now, you raised a question about superstar cities. Superstar cities are, are grotesquely unequal and the worst ones are in America. I hope that that came through from my presentation, right? Um, inequalities in America are at a crisis point, right? But other great world cities outside of America resemble those cities in sort of the general sort of vibe that they have. Now, uh, again, uh, our team with Simona and others, we did an earlier project on what we call um, um, place-based uh, distributed development policies. And we argued that different kinds of places should have different kinds of place-based policies. So for the superstars, the problem, I think it's exactly what you said. The problem on the one hand is how to keep using them as the pumps of value and value and productivity that, that, that they are and reconcile that with some kind of decency or justice at a local level. And I don't think anybody's figured that one out yet. Um, we do have probably better progress on it in Europe because we use more active urban interventions around services and housing to temper the market forces. But even in the most successful places, and I'm gonna say this, um, I should think Paris is a world city that I live in, and it has a pretty high quality of life for a world city because we pump a huge amount of policy into trying to temper the rough edges, but we are far from successful. That's the bottom line. It's still unacceptably gentrified. It has unacceptable gaps between rich and poor and so on. So this is a problem, right? It's a problem everywhere. Um, and we did advocate, we issued a report for the commission and we tried to sort of separate Europe. Uh, we did quantitative work to identify what we call different development problems for different kinds of European regions with different different policies, not a one size fits all, right? That was an earlier work that our team did. Okay, second, I wanna to return to this question about capitalism and value. So now you're really asking me and I don't have an answer. If I did, I wish I had an answer to what to do about capitalism, okay? Uh, I'm a social scientist and I try to analyze and understand the world around me to see what the facts are and to realistically try to think about what is it that I can figure out about the dynamics of the system and how possibly to intervene to make it somewhat better. You know, uh, like in my youth, I dream sometimes of an entirely different system that wouldn't have these kinds of problems. Um, and when I read people write about that stuff, whether they are nostalgic socialists, communists, or sort of like utopian post-capitalists, I get really bored because I don't think they're dealing realistically as engaged social scientists with the world we live in, okay? So that's the hardcore problem. And I think this is where we come to this whole issue for Europe. Is it possible for us to specialize in only the good, cool types of innovation and to still be part of a world capitalist system with open trade, capital flows, migration, and geopolitical and military power dynamics. That is simply like, it's, it's sort of like not dealing with the world we are in. Actually, Europe is very capitalistic. I've got news for everybody, right? It tends to be sort of a, you know, leans toward a more social democratic version of capitalism than the Americans or the Chinese. But if, but what, what we, we have to make it, if we are only going to be the good people in the world who only do the non-market innovations that don't make a lot of money, but that yes, do help people's lives, 
what are we going to do to be rich and have power in the world? I know that's a brutal question to ask, but it absolutely is one that if you're raised like me to analyze capitalism as a social scientist, you absolutely have to remain engaged with it. And our European policymakers must remain engaged with it. We have to keep our per capita incomes up high in order to enjoy all the fruits of a good life. So that's a question, and I wish I had the answer about whether we can specialize in good innovation and still have what you might call prosperous economics. But let's actually sort of deal with that. And I think that relates to China. I'm not an expert on China. I have a couple of students working on it. Um, you know, you can see it in the numbers. They seem to be doing, there's a big debate about whether China has broken through into being a true breakthrough leader uh, or whether China is sort of, you know, sort of like a, an imitator. I have a number of students working on it, but I absolutely have no idea of the answer to that. It's, it's crucial for the 21st century. Um, and, and finally, smart specialization. Um, so yeah, there have been some papers that suggest that smart specialization has had a net positive benefits and it's still early on and it's working its way through. Uh, to return to my kind of, you know, big theme about Europe, I think what I see as, as the problematic dimension of the European smart specialization strategy is it never engages with clearly with the problem of size, specialization and concentration of innovation systems, right? It says, it basically, the presumption is everywhere can be smartly specialized and that's probably true, but when you add it all up, will we be able to do breakthrough innovations, build big companies, get the market capitalization and get the wealth that flows from that? That's the question that I'm trying to get us to think about. And I'm not convinced that smart specialization is capable of carrying that weight on its shoulders. We still have time for one super short question, if uh, any. Andres. Who goes then? <laughs> okay, yes. Um, I'll be very quick, uh, Professor, thank you. Um, the question is really provocative uh, following your example. So my, 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 my question is, are we looking in Europe in the wrong direction? I mean, are we concentrating too much with concerning related to abandon of inner areas or peripheral areas with respect to driving the development of bigger center of agglomeration? Thank you. Could you just clarify the question? Are we driving too much toward I mean, uh, this question came up because, I mean, a couple of weeks ago in, in Italy, I was attending, uh, like there was a, a year of a little, little village in the center of Italy. And uh, someone ask, asked him uh, whether, I mean, since he was to receive a lot of funds for his village, and someone asked him what was the like industrial plan for the future of the village. And this is a village with less than 1,000 inhabitants uh, alone in the middle of the mountains, right? So uh, are we posing ourselves the right question regarding the right places? Thanks. No, but I think you're echoing my, you're echoing my underlying concerns about how we think about these issues in Europe. And um, we see this in every country, right? Uh, we pour, and I think I'm probably personally in favor of it. Um, if I compare, say again, Europe to America, and I look at left behind places in the two continents, the, the, the good news for Europe is that the left behind places are nicer and sort of more socially sustainable and more, more dignified um, for the people who remain in them than their equivalent places in America. The American system is very harsh, right? 
And it's, it's very upsetting to see the devastation that a completely sort of what you might call neoliberal policy agenda can do to disfavored places. Okay, however, okay, so that's the thought, but that's where you're usually in Europe, that's where we stop and we go, God, we're just like so human and so cool. And, you know, we're like so, so redistributive and so, you know, much, you know, nicer than the Americans. Because actually, if you go into these towns, let's be honest about it. I travel through rural France a lot and the towns are pretty, but the reality is sad, very sad at the moment in a lot of them. And that's nobody's fault. That's because history moved on and geography moved on. And so again, I don't have a prescription for what to do, um, but I, I, I don't think we're dealing with it clearly enough, right? That saying that a lot of these places are gonna be dynamic and innovative, it's probably false. They're not gonna be. So we should figure out what we are trying to do in those places, right? And do it for whatever reasons we decide to do it. That doesn't, uh, in other words, saying that the innovation will occur there is a way of avoiding the question that I was posing, which is Europe, in my opinion, should be a world innovation powerhouse so that European values can exist in a 21st century world values of things like justice, ecological transition, humanism, um, culture, and the things that I hold dearly. In capitalism, you can't do them unless you're also rich and powerful. And that returns us to the need to be one of the world innovation powerhouse continents, right? So that's kind of where I wanna always return my analysis to. I think we can close the session now with a big thank to Michael for his inspiring speech. And a big thank to all participants and to those that raised questions. So the plan is to meet for the next sessions and I wish you an enjoyable conference. Yes, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, just before you leave, uh, let me share you uh, three technical infos.